Today on Blue 58, the Packers are having minicamp, which is a good opportunity to pick up on a few storylines we mentioned previously. But beyond that, there's a question that's been on my mind that I think we should talk about. What if the Packers learned the wrong lessons from 2021? Blue 58! Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue 58, the one and only podcast of ThePowerSweep.com. I'm your host, John Meerdink. Very happy to be with you here for another episode. Some thanks are in order before we get too far into this show. I owe each of you who reached out a deep uh, debt of gratitude uh, for the kind words after last time. Um, Obviously a tough situation, uh, but it was nice to get up to Wisconsin, see a whole bunch of family. Everybody but one person could make it, and that was only due to illness that they couldn't make it out. Um, It was as good as these things can be. So I appreciate you, who those of you who reached out, um, and those of you who are just understanding about some some time away from the podcast, that means a lot to me. Uh, it was great to be there, especially for my grandma. Obviously, losing her husband of 66 years is a pretty big deal. Um, but it, it was a, a great time to be with family and to celebrate the life of a pretty, pretty cool guy. Uh, someone, obviously, who had a big impact on my life. On top of that, we've got something else coming up this week that we need to talk about. Our Blue 58 book club starts with our very next episode. We are discussing the games that changed the game beginning with this Friday's episode. We're going to go, and go to we're going to go one chapter per week on this book. The chapters are a little bit bigger. There's fewer of them, and I think it'll take us right up to the start of of training camp, maybe a little bit into training camp depending how quickly we go if we have to miss an episode in there. Um, just because of, you know, stuff going on with the Packers. I don't anticipate that, but we'll see. Um, But that's the plan. So if you're reading along with us, uh, be ready for Chapter 1, starting with the very next episode. All right? Sounds good? Good. It's minicamp in Green Bay, and last time around we talked about some of the off-season storylines that we were going to be watching, and that gives us an opportunity to pick up on a few of those storylines. How have things changed in just a couple weeks? Well, Alan Lazard, for one, is still gone, and I, I don't think I have anything... To add there, he's just he's still gone for whatever reason. Um, he is not in Green Bay for minicamp. Uh, he's going to have to be sooner or later because he's got to sign that tender. Uh, does he want a little extra time off? I, I have a little bit of a hard time believing that. Um, it's not like you're really – this isn't a whole lot to ask to be there for mandatory minicamp. Um, if you've got an opportunity, I guess, to not be there and you don't want to be, all right, fine. It is hard to read this as anything other than a holdout, to me at least. And I think that's, he may have a point there, and I don't know if we talked about this last time in depth, but Alan Lazard really right now is just paying for the previous sin of having just been an undrafted free agent back in 2018. Had he been drafted in 2018 like Marquez Valdez Scandling was, he'd have been able to cash in on the free agent market this offseason. But instead, he bounces around the league for a little bit, has to be an exclusive rights free agent for the Packers for a couple of years, and now ends up as an, a restricted free agent instead of heading to unrestricted free agency this past offseason and getting the guaranteed money that goes with it. So I wouldn't blame him at all if he just says, hey, I would like the guaranteed money, please. And the Packers just say, no, we're not going to do that uh, because we don't have to. Is that a wise business decision for them? In some ways, yes. In some ways, you maybe don't antagonize a guy that you don't have to. But uh, they hold all the cards here. And this is really the only leverage he has is holding out of minicamp. And boy, not very much leverage, I would say. Especially as we transition to the next storyline with Sammy Watkins back in Green Bay. Apparently he had been around for some of the non-public OTAs. Packers obviously not worried about his presence there or not. But he's there in Green Bay. Nothing really to say there. Just need to make a note of it. Finally, David Bakhtiari, back in Green Bay, but still not participating in Green Bay. Think of that nuclear doomsday clock here. We are approaching midnight with the David Bakhtiari situation, I think. Midnight for me is if he's not able to go for the start of the regular season. Some people might say training camp. I say if he can get into training camp at all and just do whatever he needs to do to be ready for the start of the regular season, that's fine with me. But the the start of the regular season is zero hour as far as I'm concerned. So if that is the doomsday scenario, what does midnight look like for the Packers? In this scenario, I'm assuming that Elton Jenkins is also not available. What does the Packers offensive line look like? Right now, your left tackle is probably Yash Nyman. Your left guard, 
one of the easier decisions, John Runyon. Your center is Josh Myers. So far, so good. The right guard is probably going to be Sean Ryan, Zach Tom, or Royce Newman, leaving the right tackle to be either Sean Ryman or Royce Newman or maybe Cole Van Lannen. Now, looking at that picture, I don't love the left side, but I can probably live with it. The right side, though, I like Sean Ryan. I like Zach Tom. I can tolerate Royce Newman. But a combination of two of those three guys starting in week one makes me a little bit queasy, to say the least. We've talked previously about offensive line being a weak link position. You just want to avoid having an obvious weak link. But I think there's a case to be made that the reverse could also be true. You need one really strong guy, preferably a tackle, to build the rest of the offensive line around. You may. Now, the Packers' offensive line last year didn't really come apart until they were without any option as that one guy, especially a tackle. They weathered being without David Bakhtiari. They weathered being without Elton Jenkins because they still had Billy Turner. But once all three of those guys were down, down being a relative term because Billy Turner did play in the playoffs, but it was on on a bad wheel and in a position he hadn't played in a year across from Dennis Kelly, it was it was a tough situation. Maybe Yash Nyman would have made a difference that day, maybe not. But even so, even if he's out there, you still don't have any one stud offensive lineman on your, your unit of five there. That offensive line looks completely different with one of either Bakhtiari or Jenkins in the lineup. If David Bakhtiari, or let's just say Elton Jenkins, can play. Say he doesn't t- tear his ACL against the Vikings. And sure, you're without... David Bakhtiari, that's bad. But say Elton Jenkins can go at left tackle in the playoffs. Then left to right, you've got Jenkins. You've got John Runyon. You've got Josh Myers back for the playoffs. You've got Lucas Patrick at right guard. You don't have to put Royce Newman there. And then you can figure everything else out at right right tackle. Instead, you've just kind of got this cascading series of issues. A lot of moving parts going into the playoffs. It ends up being a problem. If Bakhtiari is not back for the start of the regular season, the Packers are going to have problems. They need at least one guy they can really count on on that offensive line as they navigate a few other changes up front, too. That leads me to another topic I'd like to talk about. And this is not, I will admit right up front, not a fully formed idea here, but it's something I want to talk through in a couple of different scenarios. It's the idea of learning the wrong lessons from a situation. I was listening to a podcast recently, as I frequently do. It was an interview on Dan Carlin's non-hardcore history history show, Hardcore History Addendum. He did an interview last December, I want to say it was, with Max Brooks about asymmetrical warfare. And I was re-listening to that episode recently. Uh, Max Brooks is a senior fellow at the Modern War Institute at West Point, in addition to being Mel Brooks' son, and in addition to being a comedy writer, and a writer of a bunch of zombie books and things like that. Uh, But his main gig is is working as that senior fellow at the Modern War Institute. And he and Dan Carlin were talking about warfare, as they do pretty frequently on that show. And in a throwaway line, Brooks said that Desert Storm might have been the worst war that the United States has ever fought, the Gulf War in 1991 or the early 90s, whenever it was. You might agree with that opinion, you might not, but I thought his reasoning as to how he came to that conclusion was interesting. He thought that it was the worst war the United States has ever fought because they learned all of the wrong lessons from it. The thinking, as he sees it, from Desert Storm on was, if we can just get a bunch of tanks and armor and basically out-hardware our opponent, we'll just stomp all over whoever we face, and that'll be that. It worked in Desert Storm, and it's going to work everywhere else too. But the problem was that that approach, at least according to Max Brooks's opinion, was that all that the war there really achieved was teaching the rest of the world that if you want to make things difficult for the United States, you better not try to do it with conventional warfare. And history has shown, he says, that the United States has spent the next now 30-something years trying to just refight Desert Storm while every opponent we go up against refuses to fight that way. We're still trying to win a war the way we won the last one. Everyone else has realized that there's no chance of, in, no chance of competing with the United States in that kind of a war. 
the United States learned the wrong lesson from their success. Now, maybe that's true and maybe it isn't, but I think the idea of learning the wrong lesson is one worth exploring because I think there's a few situations on the Packers where the Packers are doing things that could be the result of learning the wrong lessons. Let's talk through a couple of those examples. First, Devontae Adams and the movement away from a true number one receiver in Green Bay. Extenuating circumstances aside, the Packers seem to be broadly fine with the idea of not having one big dog wide receiver this year. They're trying to make up for not having Devontae Adams by having essentially a bunch of guys. You've got Alan Lazard and Randall Cobb and Amari Rodgers coming over from last year. Added to that, you've got Sammy Watkins and Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs and a bunch of other you know smaller moving parts in there as well. I think you can see the Packers thinking there too. Sure, they're hopefully they're hoping without question that Christian Watson grows into that true number one receiver type guy down the road. But I think if they're honest with themselves, they're they're not going to say that's what he'll be in 2022. I think you can see the Packers thinking here though. They look at the past couple of years in the playoffs and say, sure, everything was great to that point, but what does having one stud wide receiver really do for us? So as a result, they're going into 2022 trying something different. A bunch of guys that are pretty good, but no clear number one guy. Now they might be right here. You still need more good guys than just Devontae Adams, whether you have a good one like Devontae Adams or not. That's been a consistent criticism of mine for years in Green Bay. They don't really have anybody who can go out and just win one-on-one other than Devontae Adams. And a subplot of the divisional round loss to the 49ers was no MVS that day. They had Devontae Adams and Alan Lazard and Randall Cobb, and that was really it at receiver. They didn't have Robert Tunyon. Um, There was a lack of playmakers at receiver. And other than Devontae Adams, Alan Lazard and Randall Cobb got to be schemed open. MVS, if nothing else is faster than just about anybody else in the NFL and can win one-on-one matchups that way. But it's possible that the Packers could be wrong about this approach. Sure, it's good to have a bunch of guys that are pretty good, but you're adding more moving parts by relying on your scheme. And more moving parts leads to complications and leads to breakdowns and leads to cascading issues if your approach doesn't work. They didn't devote any resources to going out and trying to get a guy who could be their kind of undisputed number one wide receiver. Now, it's possible they believe they have that guy in someone like Alan Lazard or even Christian Watson or Sammy Watkins, but it seems more like they're trying to go with that kind of by-committee approach. They could be wrong. They could have learned the wrong lessons from their failures with Devontae Adams, but they're at least trying something different. What about a different situation? What about their investment at inside linebacker? Now, last year, the Packers won big with Devondre Campbell. They plucked him off the street in the middle of summer, and he was fantastic. And then they doubled down on that move by re-signing him to a big contract. And then they doubled down on that bet again by drafting Quay Walker. Now the Packers have more talent at inside linebacker than they've had in, I don't know, how long. So is the lesson here that they should have been investing at inside linebacker all along, given the success they had when they finally did? Or was their defense really all that much better with him? Surely they're betting it's the former. Yep, we should have been spending more on getting a a top-tier inside linebacker, but we just didn't. And then we got one and it worked, and now we're trying to keep him and add more talent there. Now, the Packers definitely did benefit from Devondre Campbell being very steady, being very consistent, uh, contributing against the run and against the pass being a really consistent tackler. He's probably their best single inside linebacker since I'm not even sure when. He's probably better than Desmond Bishop was. He's right up there with, you know, Nick Barnett in terms of being at least all over the field. He's probably better pure talent-wise than both of those guys. And the defense was better with him than it was without him. But they might be wrong in that they're probably overpaying Devondre Campbell a little bit. I mean, he was really good, don't get me wrong, but his best attribute was in many ways the same as Blake Martinez. Just don't mess it up. Don't miss your tackles. Make a few plays here and there if they come your way, but mostly just be assignment sure. Don't mess it up. 
Are you really giving him a big contract for that? And I, I know I'm oversimplifying here, but by how much am I oversimplifying? Did they learn the wrong lesson about what having an inside linebacker means? Finally, just as a third example, the Packers are trying to ride a trend of getting bigger on defense. They've got Quay Walker as essentially what's going to amount to being their their dime linebacker. They've got Devontae Wyatt now as Kenny Clark's primary running mate, presumably instead of Dean Lowry. Basically, what it seems like the Packers are trying to do here is time a market cycle. The NFL goes through cycles in terms of what works, how teams build their rosters, what they do in terms of play calling, things like that. And right now we're on in an upswing of a size boom. For a long time, NFL offenses were going faster and faster and spreading things out more and more and more and pass and pass and pass. And to be sure, that's still a big part of the league. But defense is corrected by getting faster and smaller and lighter themselves, having those money backers, those hybrid safety linebacker types, trying to catch up to the offenses. And I think offenses responded by going towards the more the real proliferation of this wide zone, um, kind of run-oriented, maybe size-oriented offense. Teams are trying to get bigger again as a result. They're trying to take on those run-oriented offenses with big linebackers, or at the very least having linebackers on the field instead of having defensive backs on the field. The Packers are certainly trying to do that. They spend a first-round pick on what amounts to being a part-time linebacker, a position they'd normally have filled with a day three pick or undrafted free agent or maybe even a defensive back. We've seen that year after year after year after year in Green Bay. The Packers are betting that the league's metagame is going to continue to reward bigger defenses, athletic defenses, as offenses try to continue to run things like the Packers run, essentially. Now, if they're right, they'll be perfectly positioned to have an elite defense for the late Rodgers era here. But if they're wrong, this is just a misfire on roster building. They should have spent those first round picks on offense. We know that offense is what drives most of the league. So if you're going to continue to build your team, continue to lean on the offense, right? Right? Instead of building on, on a defense that may not be in tune with what the, the rest of the league is is trying to do. You're trying to solve a problem that the, the rest of the league isn't arguing anymore at a certain point. Now, I'm not saying the Packers are right or wrong in any of these approaches. But I, I do think raising the question of whether or not they're learning the right lessons in these scenarios is an important one. Heck, you could and people have, had a similar conversation about Aaron Rodgers himself. Is the lesson to be taken away from the 2021 season that Rodgers can't do it in the playoffs and therefore you should move on? Or was it just that it was an unlucky day or a bad matchup or injuries hitting the Packers at the wrong time? Were the Packers unlucky, in short, in 2020 or in 2021? You can have that conversation. And that's a big part, I think, of evaluating the Packers in the long term. If you want to criticize the Packers or have a critical eye toward what the Packers are doing, I'm not talking about being negative. I'm talking about looking at the team like a a reviewer, an analyst. Those are the sorts of questions that I think you have to ask. Did the Packers rightfully adapt to a given situation? And that is something that I think we need to monitor long term. Before we dive into weeks 14 to 16, I want to take a second, out, a second and shout out patrons Carl Schlinksbeer, uh, Scotty Tuska, and Richard Hoffman. Carl, in particular, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. But in any case, I'm grateful to each of the three of you for being loyal Patreon supporters. And I'd be grateful if you listening would join them. Patreon.com slash the power sweep is where you do that. And if you choose to become a contributor at any monthly amount, you get a slew of benefits, including some bonus content, as well as access to our discord server, where you can chat Packers football with people from all over the world. It's a really good time. It's a fun place to hang out. And with OTAs and minicamp and all sorts of stuff beginning to heat up as we head into the summer months, it's a great place to hang out too. And make sure you're on top of all the news that's going on with the Green Bay Packers. So consider that patreon.com slash the power sweep. I'd be happy to shout you out if you do. Weeks 14 to 16, we left off with the Packers beating the Rams last time. They had a week 13 bye, then returned to Lambeau Field to take on the Bears. Packers end up winning 45 to 30, but the Packers nearly ended up on a wrong on the wrong side of a classic this means more to us type game kind of a relative of the trap game. It's a situation where one team has more to gain 
pretty much emotionally than the other team. And the Packers had more, or the Bears, excuse me, had more to gain, I think, emotionally from beating the Packers than the Packers did from beating the Bears. The benefits for the Packers are mostly um, intangible. Other than what goes on on the field, they win and they keep the status quo. They stay in the running for the, the bye week, the number one seed in the playoffs. But the Bears win and they ruin a significant chunk of the Packers' season. They really hurt the Packers if they win. And I think you see that early in this game. Because the Bears were on point, the Packers were not. Defensive and special teams breakdowns led to a big first half for Chicago. They had a 46-yard touchdown pass, a 54-yard touchdown pass, and a 97-yard punt return for a touchdown. Bears were up 27-21 at the half, and it could have been 21-14, but for Rasul Douglas's second pick six in as many games. But the second half belonged to the Packers, 17-0 in the third quarter, and that was that. Another seven in the fourth gave the Packers 45 points and the win. On the one hand, the Packers really never should have trailed in this game. They're way better than the Bears and should have handled them. But on the other hand, they still put up 45 points without even really trying that hard. And they put up 17 in a decisive stretch in the third quarter. Really, it was a three-drive stretch in the second half of the third quarter that really put this game away. The Packers open the half with a nine-play, 75-yard touchdown drive. Bears get the ball back on their second play of their next drive. Preston Smith strips sacks Justin Field. Fields, Rashawn Gary recovers. And on the Packers' next play, they score. 35-27, just like that. And you may or may not believe in momentum, but that's a lot to overcome mentally, especially for for a pretty young team in Chicago. Things have been going well. Now they're not going well. And I think it's totally human thing to not handle that very well. And look what happened next. The Bears went three and out, three consecutive drives. And that basically ends the game. In terms of lasting impact, hard to really find anything from this game. This was the third consecutive season sweep of the Bears for the Packers, though. And after the 2021 season, the Packers have now won six in a row against the Bears and 11 of their last 12. Pretty good. What have we forgotten from this game? Well, big injury in this one. Billy Turner got hurt, and that may have been the straw that broke the camel's back on the offensive line. He did not play again until the playoffs, and we all know how that went. The Packers also had a fourth and goal in the third quarter. They chose to kick it to go up 38-27 instead of going for the jugular for real disappointing, but I understand. The Packers also had a nine-minute drive in the fourth quarter to put things away. One of my favorite things to say. And finally, in one of uh, the favorite small moments for me of the 2021 season, Kurt Bankert got on late in this one to kneel out the clock for the Packers. Not too shabby. In week 15, the Packers traveled to Baltimore to take on the Ravens and came out with a 31-30 win. The Packers really just couldn't put the Ravens away in this one. They tied the game late in the first half, and Packers ended up leading most of the second half, but the Ravens just stuck around. Green Bay goes up 31-17 to with just over nine minutes to go, but the Ravens scored twice to nearly tie it, and that's when the game was decided. The Ravens decided to go for two and the lead after they scored a touchdown with 42 seconds left, but they could not convert, and the Packers ended up winning. Lasting impact of this one is much like the Bears game. Looking back against uh, comparing 2021 to 2020, games like this really kind of stick in my mind because the Packers do hold serve with a win here. They stay in the race for the the, the top spot in the NFC playoffs. But it's one of those games I felt bad about at the time because of how the Packers performed relative to their potential. The 2020 team felt like they had quite a few different games where they just really put it on teams. They played their best football. They really took care of business. But down the stretch in 2021, that didn't always feel like the case for the Packers. And that that's tough to say about a game where they scored 31 against a pretty good team. But this is one of those games. The Packers just refused to put the Ravens away, and it nearly came back to bite them. In terms of small details in this one that we may have forgotten, a more of a legacy one, but Marquez Valdez Scantling scored what turned out to be his last touchdown with the Packers in this one. And it turned out to be his second to last real game with the Packers too, because he played the next week against the Browns, had a small cameo appearance in week 18 against the Lions, and then was inactive against the 49ers, as we've discussed in this episode already. Finally, week 16, the Packers take on the Browns on Christmas at Lambeau Field. Packers won 24-22, Very similar, again, to the Bears game. 
Browns had a lot more emotionally at stake than the Packers. The Browns ran wild in this one and then decided to pass at a really bad time, which we'll come back to. Nick Chubb had 17 carries for 126 yards, but none when it really mattered. The Packers, meanwhile, looked like they were at a Christmas family reunion they didn't really want to attend. The Browns were probably better than their record in 2021, but sneaking by with a two-point win at home as a contender for the Super Bowl is not a good look for the Packers. And looking through the stats, it wasn't even that the Packers were that bad necessarily. Cleveland just did a good job of shortening the game and uh, staying in it, keeping the game close by by running a lot and um, taking away opportunities for the Packers to score. The game was decided when Cleveland made the unusual decision to pass five straight times when the running game was working pretty darn well. The, the Browns got the ball back down two points with 2.05 to go on their own 25. Three runs from Nick Chubb got them out to their own 39 with a minute 39 to go. They had to pass a couple times to convert a third down, but they got to the 50-yard line with about a minute to go, first and 10, all three timeouts available. But they go incomplete, incomplete, interception. A lot of contact on the interception. Wasn't called. That's it. Game over. Browns taking away any chance for them to win the game themselves. Did the Packers win or did the Browns lose? Doesn't really matter because the scoreboard says Green Bay 24, Cleveland 22. Again, the Packers hold serve. Nothing really bigger from this one, unless you really want to read into it a little bit. I don't think the Browns stylistically were all that different from what the um, 49ers ended up doing to the Packers. They had a strong offensive line and just wanted to shorten the game and keep it close. And that ended up being the formula that worked for the 49ers against the Packers. So if you really want to look at a larger narrative here, maybe the, the Browns wrote at least part of the book on how to beat the Packers in 2021. Small nuggets, just one from this one. Uh, Amari Rodgers had probably his best play of the year, 27-yard punt return. And as we hear about him trying to come back to the Packers in the best shape of his life this season, it's worth remembering that it wasn't entirely bad, not 100% bad for Rodgers in 2021. Pretty close, but not 100%. So I've got for you in this episode. I appreciate you listening in. I'd appreciate it even more if you would take a second and uh, share this episode with someone you think would like it. That is the number one way this show has grown is through word of mouth. We can do all we want about putting out great shows and uh, doing a good job promoting it and all that sort of good stuff. But it's it's really been up to you, the audience, uh, to help us grow. And we're grateful for what you've done in that respect. You can also support us on Patreon or wherever else you would like to um, to get involved there. Buy a t-shirt from our Tee Public store. Links to both of those things are in your notes for this podcast as well. Um, I would appreciate it, though, if you would share this because getting more people involved with listening to the show, with interacting with the show, is the number one thing that helps all of us, perhaps me most of all, become smarter Packers fans. And as I always say, smarter Packers fans are better Packers fans, and better Packers fans are what we all want to be. I'm your host, John Meerdink. We'll see you next time on Blue 58.